This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back, we're live, and that is Carlos Suarez right there. And he's at the University of Ameri the Americas Puebla, which is 20 miles southeast of Me Mexico City, am I right? Well, a little farther, maybe about 60 miles straight east. Okay. Well, if you're walking, close by. if you're walking, it's a big difference. <laughs> it's a stone's throw, but uh, very close in the outskirts. Uh, today, it's practically a almost a suburb, but uh, you know, about an hour and a half away. Uh, and uh, a beautiful, a beautiful uh, colonial city. Uh, Puebla is the big city, and this is a suburb of that. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm delighted to be joining you again here, and of course, speaking to you from Mexico. Uh, looking forward to offering you uh, some perspective about this, you know, big new announcement of a new trade deal, the new NAFTA. Yeah, we're calling this show NAFTA 2.0 renegotiating free trade, Trump style. Uh-oh. <laughs> so can you tell our listeners exactly what the North American Free Trade Agreement is and who it used to involve and what it used to say before he pulled the plug on it? <laughs> well, yeah, a couple of quick points. I, I mean, the bottom line is the plug has not been pulled. It is still in place. Uh, it is a trade agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada that was signed and basically went into effect 1994. So we're almost at the 25-year anniversary. Um, I want to maybe show, uh, there's a, one uh, graphic, I have a little picture with a map that shows this is the North American region, Mexico, uh, the southern partner, the U.S., and Canada. So these three countries have had a basically a trilateral trade agreement signed uh, again in the early 90s that went into effect January 1 of 94. It has certainly deepened the interdependence between these countries, and today we have a massive flow of trade Gosh, I think the, the latest figures, if I recall, is something like $1.4 trillion. I mean, just a massive amount. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the trade agreement uh, was one of the first things that Trump, during the campaign, said it was the most horrible deal ever made, the worst uh, for America, quite a bit of hyperbole. In the end, I mean, it really depends on where you sit, but this agreement has certainly fostered a great deal of trade expansion for all three countries. Uh, obviously, the trade is uneven, so there are winners and losers, and like always in the case of trade, uh, often the winners are general as consumers and certain groups, but the losers are often very specific and narrow, and so, it, you know, again, it depends on who you're asking who wins and loses. Uh, as we know from economists, overall trade tends to benefit countries, and, you know, by and large, these three have all benefited in different ways. Nevertheless, Trump uh, coming to office was very, very critical of, of the of the agreement and over the last 13 months the three countries have been negotiating uh it got pretty nasty and pretty ugly uh, you may recall trump uh you you know referred to uh justin i'm um, not justin sorry uh, here justin trudeau up in uh, canada is a very weak and, and dishonest uh he, he really you know said some nasty things about this you know very important trade partner and ally to the north uh, as well uh, came to office with a very critical view towards mexico However, um, by late August, uh, just over a month ago, the U.S. and Mexico had reached an agreement on a new revised treaty. Now, I want to say the short answer is that this is really the, the new agreement that's now been agreed by all three is really an important update, revision, sort of, you know, tinkering on the margins, uh, but it does not effectively uh, eliminate or replace NAFTA. It's simply a fine-tuning. So that's why I call it a 2.0. Now, very important also, these three uh, leaders have now made this agreement, and they've just put out the details, so we're quickly combing through 32 chapters. It's going to be a, a process that uh, it's going to take a lot more negotiation because nothing happens until the three legislatures, the Congress, the Parliament in Canada, the Mexican Congress, all three have to essentially ratify it themselves. All three countries going through their own political transitions, as we know, the U.S. Congress, probably after January, when it comes back, will we'll be in a new... Uh, uh, likely change. Mexico inaugurates a new president December 1, and so it has a big change as well. And Canada has its own provincial elections right now this month in Quebec. Next year is likely to have a general election. So those are important to note because those dynamics mean there's still a negotiation that's going to continue. Let me unpack Never some of that. Yeah, let me yeah, unpack no. some of that with you. Uh, gee, that's a lot of information, Carlos. So just uh, just for me, um, so we had a we had a trade agreement between the U.S. Uh, and Canada and Mexico that was that's in that was in place a long time and it's still in place it's just that Trump has been place. attacking it is that right well it, you know again from the perspective of Trump he's saying this replaces it not quite really 
most of NAFTA remains, and it is obviously a deep level of integration. This one does add some important new angles that uh, are noteworthy. Uh, it fine-tunes parts of it. But did he uh, effectively, I, again, did he effectively sorry, terminate the agreement? No. Well, that, that's what he has said, but that can't happen. The president cannot, you know, by executive decree, decree end that. Uh, it's, a, it's a treaty that was signed and ratified by the U.S. Senate. It has to be so, as well ratified again. So, so his well, remarks have only been a statement of intention. Uh, and, and yeah. in fact, the earlier agreement, day to day, still exists. It's still oh, there. It's, it's still binding absolutely. on the parties. Okay, the other thing is, uh, you've been following this, you're into international law, and in fact, you're the, you're the director of the International Diplomacy School uh, at the um, university uh, in Puebla. Um, you know, I, in my youth, I, and, and I'm still very young, uh, in my youth, I had never heard that the president would go out and negotiate or make threats to terminate or reorganize trade agreements, and that there was a whole you know, group of agencies in the United States and in most countries that went and did this. The president himself would not do this. But, but uh, and I'm thinking, I'd like you to just tell me yes or no, I'm thinking this is quite remarkable where Trump as president all of a sudden, um, without the benefit of those agencies, decides he wants to change it all, terminate it, modify it, whatnot. Yeah. Is that usually the president's role or have I just not been following it? Well, in a nutshell, at least in the United States, foreign economic policy, trade policy, is divided. So the president does negotiate, and he is the lead, he's the head of state, so he can initiate a process of, of negotiating this treaty. It does not become law until the U.S. Senate ratifies it. So the Senate has the power and the, needs to ratify the treaty. Uh, and that's why, again, this is going to continue until 2019. There will be a sometime well into the year where there will be a negotiation in the Congress to decide whether they accept the terms of this treaty or whether they want to be a work in progress. Very similar in Canada, although the parliamentary system there, the prime minister does control the majority of, of, of the parliament, and so you know he can get it through easier. In our case, the president's going to have to negotiate. Uh, we will see what happens with the Senate. Yeah. The House will have a say, but they do not actually ratify it. They can simply... Yeah discuss it and articulate their interests. Okay, the other thing that I, I thought I heard say was that uh, the deal with Mexico was, at least for a time, going to be a separate deal, and the deal with Canada was going to be a separate deal, um, and it was not going to be like the NAFTA of the old time was going to be U.S.-Mexico and then another one for U.S.-Canada. Where are we now on that? Are we back together in a three-party deal? We are, uh, and in effect what happened is the U.S. and Mexico and Canada, all three had been negotiating for about a year. Near the end, the U.S. and Mexico sort of took a little side detour and decided uh, to basically agree on a set of uh, understanding, they called it, and this was late August. Canada was not on board. They had some particular issues, particularly their dairy, far or dairy industry that remained you know, somewhat protected and some other provisions. Well, over the last five, six weeks, Finally, the Canadians at the very last hour, September 30th, just before midnight, which was this self-imposed deadline the U.S. had put, the Canadians and the U.S. did agree. Now, Trump was saying all along that, you know, if the U.S. and Mexico, if Canada wants to come on in, they can. But the reality is uh, the Mexico, for example, and many in, in the U.S. were of the view that without Canada, this was a, a non-starter. It wasn't going to happen. It would have been very, very hard for the U.S. Congress to approve a new U.S.-Mexico deal without Canada. So, in effect, Canada has been brought in, and they did some last-minute, uh, you know, negotiating, uh, coming to terms. So it is back to the three parties. Uh, it is a new agreement that each of them have their own different interests, but they are all agreement in, in, in the single uh, revised version of the NAFTA. They're calling it a new name. That's probably the single biggest change, uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement. Uh, mostly because Trump just doesn't seem to like the word NAFTA. But at the end of the day, it remains a trade agreement between these three countries. But it's been modernized. It's been updated. And perhaps it's one of the biggest additions is that today it deals with intellectual property in a way that didn't exist 25 years ago. Protection over pharmaceuticals and patents and uh, digital uh, sort of media issues. So that's an innovation uh, that, that has in some ways just upgraded it to, to the modern it's not remarkable. It's not remarkably different than it was uh, when he came into office, though, huh? No, not really. Moreover, these newer provisions, the intellectual property, are almost verbatim 
the agreements that the U.S. had already agreed in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, an agreement with many of the Asian countries, the U.S. under Trump quickly pulled out of that. Uh, and so in some ways, you know, Trump, he could really go back and just rename that the Trump-Pacific Partnership and, and be joining the club because quite literally under NAFTA, we're doing the same provisions with Mexico and Canada. Um, but I, I want to say that probably the biggest uh, area of attention and the biggest economic sector between these three countries is the automotive industry. And that's where there have been some, some revisions. Again, it's not massive and substantial, but they are noteworthy, uh, having to do with how much content the cars have uh, from the three respective countries. So, for example, under NAFTA, the current treaty, 62.5% of the content must come from North America uh, and to be duty-free. And therefore, you know, a car can be assembled here in Mexico, exported back to the U.S. with no tariffs. That's going to increase to 75 percent, and and that's just one example of the type of adjustments that have been made. So, uh, w what about Canada versus Mexico? I mean, is the deal, say, on cars, on cars, uh, that's being made now that Trump is making with Mexico, the same, the 60 percent rule as the deal with Canada, or is yeah. it different? Yeah, yeah, no, it is the same. And so, on one hand, that provision is meant to increase the content from North America in general. So all three should benefit from that theoretically. It means fewer imports from China, from Malaysia. Some of the cars that we have assembled today will have some components, the electronics that come from there. So that is a benefit perhaps for all three. The other, however, what an interesting provision that addresses more the domestic uh, U.S. Uh, and also Canadian workers is that now a higher percentage, something like 40 to 45 percent of the cars must have uh, uh, must be done or manufactured, assembled by workers who earn $16 an hour or more. And what that really means is that Mexico, where the wages are about a third of that, uh, essentially may lose out on some of that. The U.S. and Canada uh, might, you know, might be given some incentive to to manufacture more. But here again, uh, it's not clear what the real world uh, impact is going to be. Uh, some automakers may choose to ignore that, and and the alternative is to pay a two and a half percent tariff if you have let's say, more workers from Mexico, and the difference may not be that much. Uh, they could replace some workers with robots. That's happening all the time, and so fewer workers. Uh, they could do, for example, Mexico really is one of the main manufacturers today. Uh, some of those exports from Mexico could be redirected to Asia or Europe and simply go to a different market, uh, or some of them may choose potentially to just leave North America altogether. Maybe there are some Japanese manufacturers or, or Germans that, uh, that manufacture in the U.S. or in Mexico. There's Here in Pueblo, there's an Audi factory, a big Volkswagen factory. Um, now, it's not like they're planning to leave, but they could redirect some of their, uh, potentially some of their uh, uh, products to other markets. Yeah, well, I just wonder, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the reason for insisting on a $16 an hour wage? Is that, is that supposed to help Mexico? No. Is, is it because he wants to help Mexico? Um, primarily, it's directed for the U.S. domestic workers, so that a higher percentage of the workforce comes from the U.S. That's the idea in principle. But as I just said, it's not clear that's going to translate to more in the U.S. because the U.S. itself is becoming a more, you know, robot-oriented uh, you know, yeah. manufacturing. Uh, but in general, it's meant more to support the workers in the U.S. and Canada. The average workers make about $22 an hour, uh, and so it's a slight incentive to manufacture more. Now. The, the other side of this is that that adds cost to a vehicle. So if it's being made more in the U.S. or Canada, the cost is going to go up, up and that's going to be passed on to a consumer. So, uh, again, who wins? Well, you know, maybe some manufacturers of cars, but they will pass on those costs to the consumers. And mm -hmm. so, it, you know, it, it, it kind of washes out. Yeah, you know, before we take this break, Carlos, I just want to offer a thought I've had and see, see what you think about it. Uh, so, you know, Trump has been in... Um, in, in, embroiled in the, in the Kavanaugh confirmation. <clears throat> in fact, the country, if not the world. I'm sure people, the people in Mexico watch the hearings oh, yeah. just the way we do. <clears throat> and so the United States government is all, uh, is all distracted into this, this Kavanaugh uh, confirmation. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that, we get the good news about NAFTA. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. reaction, my reaction is, well, um, this, this is a distraction from the distraction. In other words, uh, this, no. this, is, this is only so he can say that he did something and get people's attention off this failing nomination. What do you think? What do the people around you think? Well, you know, if we didn't have all those dramas playing out, uh, this would be bigger news. It would be quite important. And it is in some ways, it is a partial victory for the president. Now, 
mind you, the way we got there was a pretty nasty one. So while the outcome at the end is okay, look back at the 13 months in which there was this nastiness towards the, our very you know strong partner to the north. Uh, and so is it really worth that? And in many ways, uh, there's an interesting comparison. It's like somebody, maybe a, a man who walks into a, a China shop and breaks everything up and they pay him and then decides, well, okay, I'm going to stop now, uh, and now I'm going to be calm. And, and yet, you know, you, you've done a lot of damage, and so is it really worth that? But look, uh, it, it is an important breakthrough, uh, and yet when we look at the Trump style of making the deal. I mean, it begins with a pretty rough uh, nastiness, and uh, maybe that works again in you know making real estate deals in the Queens or Brooklyn. Uh, but on the world arena, we have lost considerable credibility. The U.S., you know, the way we've treated particularly Canada, again, a national security threat, a nasty, dishonest, weak leader, that's not how you treat your close friends. And, uh, and so there's a lot of damage that will probably take years to recover, probably until Trump is gone, whatever successor will have to sort of patch things up. Uh, in the meantime, life goes on, and yeah, the treaty has to, you know, get negotiated still at the level of the legislatures. But um, how we got there, you know, you just can't forget it was a pretty ugly process. Yeah, it leaves, it leaves, uh, it leaves a scar somehow. Uh, and I guess Absolutely. I take it from what you say is that, <clears throat> you know, uh, and you're into international diplomacy, international relations, and this kind of nego negotiation. Um, the United States could have, let's assume this is a good result, and we'll evaluate that some more after the break, but let's assume this is a good result. We, the United States, could have gotten to this result without any acrimony. It would have evolved by itself with, with gentlemen sitting at a table, am I right? And that's what traditionally happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and again, because in many ways, even the way the U.S. came into this at the beginning, they were demanding some very just, you know, non-starters, some, some unrealistic uh, negotiating, let's say, uh, requests. Uh, the U.S., for example, wanted a sunshine clause that after, I think it was about after five years, they could decide to just opt out of the agreement altogether. Well, if you're a business person, you need certainty, you need predictability. And so instead, that, that so-called sunshine clause... Instead, it's more like, well, we will every four years we'll look at it, but that doesn't mean you can exit it. You can revise it and, mm. and revisit it, but you need some certainty about these things. Uh, so that was just one example where the U.S. was very unrealistic. The other, and we can talk more about this after the break, is you know, the, for example, the dairy industry in, in in Canada. The president was obsessed with this, but at the end of the day, it's a minuscule part of the big picture. Uh, and and moreover, the U.S. actually exports five times more dairy products to Canada already. And so he saw this, I think, as a way of making it sound like he was going to somehow break open this massive market. It's a small piece of the big trade that, that occurs. Uh, but we have to understand, put it in the right context. What, what are we really talking about? Uh, but that was a very sticky mm. issue for the U.S. and Canada. Mm. So, yeah, we'll talk about that. I also want to talk about the relationship, if any, between the negotiations around NAFTA uh, and immigration. And the wall, mm -hmm. whether that played any role at all. We'll be right back with Carlos Suarez in Mexico right after this break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. Physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required. And you get to actively participate in your care. Choose to improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. Okay, we're back with Carlos Suarez, and he is in the University of, uh, let's see, of, of Puebla uh, in Mexico. What's of the, what? the Americas. Of the Americas. Americas University in, of the Americas. Yes. Then I will come down to say hi. Um, in any event, I uh, really enjoy these conversations, uh, and he runs the International uh, uh, Diplomacy School, International Relations School at that university, so he's in a perfect position to look at this uh, objectively from Mexico. 
Uh, yeah, so I let me let me go with my question first, and we can go with what you were talking about over over dairy and other specific terms that came out of it in a tripartite agreement. Um, what about what about you know? I mean, Trump came into office on on the wall and uh, being up on Mexican immigrants. Um, so wh where was that? If this was such uh, you know a reflection of Mexican American relations. I didn't hear anything about uh, inclusion of the terms relating to immigration of the wall or, or estranged children, um, you know, in, in connection with NAFTA. What happened? Yeah. Well, it, in effect, they were delinked. They were not really part of the, the negotiation over this trade agreement. And maybe it's a good way of, of contrasting NAFTA with what you might see in the case of the European Union, which is a deeper level of integration. It is a trade agreement, a customs union, but it's also integrating social, political, foreign policy, you know, trying to create a, you know, immigration policy. Uh, Mexico, the U.S. and Canada do not have that. So this is really a focused uh, trade agreement on, on trade and, and goods, uh, and it is not so much about uh, uh, these others. And, you know, Mexico will remind uh, the U.S. they will not pay for the wall. Uh, but it does still require, you know, some cooperation and, and efforts to address the challenge of, of immigration, and not just Mexicans, but Central Americans that come through Mexico. Um, so, again, they have been delinked. They are not part of this. However, um, on a more limited way, then this new NAFTA, this revision of the agreement, does address some issues related to labor and some issues related to environment in ways that it didn't very much before. Now. Uh, for environmental groups or labor groups, it's probably not sufficient or not, but uh, it is important that we have to at least note that there was some. The, the question earlier, I talked about the percentage that has to be, you know, assembled by workers that make $22 an hour. It's a way of trying to stimulate maybe some more production in the U.S. Whether that will happen is another question. Uh, but uh, immigration off the table, uh, the wall is a non, not, not even a discussion here. I mean, for Mexico, this is just a silly, stupid idea that the U.S. has. And Mexico is not going to stand ready to pay for that. You know that that's just silly. Yeah, looking at looking at the dark side of the negotiations. Suppose no deal had been reached. Suppose uh, we were left with uh, an angry Trump. Well, I suppose he's angry all the time anyway. But um, you know, and and no deal. And so he would go to Congress and or the Senate. He would say, I want to pull it. I want to terminate the whole thing. I don't want a NAFTA. No. I don't want a NAFTA with Mexico. And I don't like Canada either. No agreement. What would happen? And you can tell me about all three countries, but make sure to tell me about what would yeah. happen to the U.S. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the quick short answer is that the U.S. Congress would not let that happen. I mean, there are just too many powerful interests, too many who benefit from this relationship, whether they are importers or exporters. There are a lot of interests. Massive farmer you know, products that come to, into Mexico and imports that come from Mexico. The car manufacturing in particular, whether it's a, you know, a part supplier or a, you know, an importer of the cars. So there's just too many vested interests, too powerful. And here, uh, you know, uh, it underscores the issue of trade. It's a very complex set of issues. Uh, and, you know, for Trump and maybe those who see the world in this very simplistic black and white view, uh, you want a simple answer to everything. You know, oh, they're ripping us off, and so we have to cancel it. Well, not quite. It's a much more co complex. Uh, let me just show quickly one chart. I have the second one, which is a look at the, uh, uh, you know, pros and cons of free trade. Obviously, trade different groups differently. Uh, there are winners and losers. And in general, as a overall society, we tend to win from trade, but there are always losers. And they tend to be weaker, they tend to be marginalized, etc. And finally, the, the third uh, graph I have here is a map that illustrates the trade, you know, itself that happens between these three countries, you know, a trillion plus a, a year. And in general, uh, again, the short answer is that Canada sells more to the U.S. Uh, than um, uh, than Mexico. Uh, I'm sorry, than Mexico. Of course, it does. Uh, the, the trade from Canada to the U.S. is about 320 billion a year, and from the U.S. to Canada, 280. So there is a slight deficit. Canada does sell us more than we, you know, U.S. sells them. With Mexico, uh, it's also the case. Mexico will sell 300 plus billion to the U.S. and the U.S. will sell 250. So what we've heard a lot from Trump is that these deficits are just bad news. Now. It's not that simple because those deficits also mean that as consumers in the U.S., you can go to Costco and buy a refrigerator or a television or a, you know some nice vegetables at a price that would be doubled if you had to assemble that in the U.S. So consumers get benefits from it, obviously, uh, and others who then begin to import it. I mean, even Costco has benefited from this trade in ways that are quite dramatic both ways, Costco in Mexico, Costco in the U.S., whatever. 
um, uh, the manufacturing industry, they've all benefited substantially from it. It has shifted trade, no doubt, and there are jobs that have come south. But that's the nature of the global economy. Mm. The markets go where the trade uh, will will push them. Do you like uh, this so deal, Carlos? General, uh, yeah. Do you like this deal? I'm sorry, what? Do you like this deal? I mean, if, if you had been... Let me anoint you president of the United States for a minute. Uh, would you have done it this way? Would you, in, in substance, in terms, or would you have done it another way? Do you like it? Um, well, I don't like the way. I don't like the process. I don't like the style. I don't like obviously this very nasty aggressiveness. I mean, it just leaves a bitter taste, and 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 you know, in the end, you're exhausted, and and you don't trust. Uh, you don't build a, you know, a level of confidence, and so that that is not the way to do it. Uh, unfortunately, these things do require constant negotiation. And yes, maybe some you know uh, tactics that are pressuring here. But with Trump, we've seen just a, a very different style that is both not just a changing of the norm, but a, a certain nastiness that is just well beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I would add this: that the United States in this partnership is clearly the bigger uh, country, the bigger, more powerful. It's an asymmetrical relationship both ways, towards Canada and towards Mexico. With Mexico, it's always been very much a case where the U.S. has tended to kind of bully its way and get what it wants, uh, and it has more power to do so. Uh, and, uh, and yet, and here, for example, one of the provisions that the U.S. wanted, which it did not get, it had to give up, was there is a dispute uh, settlement mechanism in NAFTA. Whenever one of the countries feels they are being cheated or, you know, dumped on or, you know, uh, uh, out, you know, there, there's some you know legal issues. They can go to this tribunal and basically challenge it. The U.S. wanted to get away with that completely and then simply deal with these disputes bilaterally. Well, for Canada and the U. and for Mexico, that's not ideal because the U.S. is the bigger bully partner. So NAFTA was able to maintain this in the new agreement. They did not get rid of it, despite mm -hmm. what the U.S. was trying. And this gives Canada and Mexico still an ability to challenge the U.S. if it's doing something that's unfair or, or you know, it just has a dispute that needs settlement. Uh, but, uh, no, I think in the end, uh, you know, the, the, the sour taste that's left after the way, particularly and remarkable, the way in which the Trump administration treated Canada, because uh, it was just a very ugly picture in the last few days. Even in the last week, the president was openly saying, we don't like that trade negotiator, the foreign minister of Canada, Christi, Christian um, uh, Freeland, you know, just saying we don't like her as a person. I mean, they're very personal attacks in, in a way that you just, you know, it, it doesn't win you brownie points. It may with your base, but it leaves such a sour taste. Carlos, that, does, uh, does, this bring, hard. does this bring the negotiators for Mexico and Canada closer together? In other words, do they, do they share ideas, they share notes, and share strategies against the U.S.? Oh, absolutely. And when, for example, when Canada was not included, in, you know, six weeks ago, uh, Mexico was very much saying, no, we want them. And, and every chance he could get, uh, you may recall there was a strange uh, press conference about, a, you know, six weeks ago, uh, Donald Trump in the White House calls by speakerphone the Mexican president. A very strange, you know, normally you don't do that, but again, everything is different these days. And the Mexican president three times kept saying, but we need Canada in here. Let's not forget about Canada. And, you know, this is a Canada. Uh, and, uh, and so Mexico has always thought, you know, well, let's not forget about them. Mm -hmm. And so they do partner and, and they help support each other. They have different interests, but in general, they are very good relations. They yeah, and congenial. Yeah. yeah. So They're one last positive. thing is where, where are we going from here? You mentioned early on that not all the terms had been agreed and certainly none of it had been rat has been ratified by, by the yeah. uh, United States Senate. So where, where are we going from here? Are there going to be hiccups going forward, even in settling this down? Yeah. You know, he said, well, we made a deal, but maybe the deal isn't really made yet, and maybe there'll be problems yeah. Yeah. In, in completing it. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, each of the three respective countries have to get it ratified. Now, in Canada, because of the parliamentary system, it tends to be a little bit easier. The, the majority controls the, the parliament. The prime minister is a member of the parliament. So he will put it through. Now, it won't be without its own turmoil and discussion, uh, and it is an election year for them next year, too. With the U.S. Congress, again, the Senate, we don't know today what the outcome will be after the midterms, but today it's a very closely divided uh, you know, uh, camp. Uh, the Senate must ratify it, and that means there will be a discussion, a debate, a dialogue, and um, you know there will be strong interest to... On one hand, to maintain this because there, you know, there's a very powerful support for it in general, uh, and the same in Mexico. And Mexico has its own dynamic. December one, they inaugurate a new president. Uh, so far, he has been supportive of this outgoing one in terms of the agreement itself. But you know.
know, once in power, he also will have interest in maybe wanting to fine-tune aspects of it. So all three countries are likely to want to tinker with it a little bit, perhaps trying to keep the overall framework, but, but there will be a continued di dialogue, continued negotiation. So suppose I uh, represent, uh, I'm a lobbyist, I represent an American company which uh, doesn't feel it got a good, a good shake in what Trump negotiated, say, with Mexico. Uh, I can go to my favorite senator now, after whatever he negotiated is, you know, is, is delivered to the Senate for approval, I can go to my favorite senator and try to change that and say, my favorite senator, don't, don't approve that. Change that. I still want what I wanted before. And uh, you can override Trump on that. This is possible, right? Yes, absolutely, of course. So there will be, again, and like everything, it always comes down to a few key people, the sort of the swing votes that might be in the electoral districts that, you know, uh, are also at issue here. Maybe it's agricultural interests that want more. Uh, but I think uh, my sense is that overall the, the agreement that has been, you know, outlined now, and we're just looking at the fine details, but overall it is not the worst outcome that was feared when Trump was announcing we're going to do away with it, close it, you know, revoke it. That hasn't happened. And so that's why I go back to really this is a, NAFTA 2.0, it may have a new name, but that's just like changing the color of your tie. It remains a, a trade agreement between these three countries that simply fine-tunes parts of it on the margins. And, and it does add some new important dimensions. But uh, going back to the process, a very ugly one that got us there. Uh, and so we, we might like the outcome. We have to be weary yeah. of, of how we got there. Yeah, that, and it sounds to me, we, we, we're out of time here, but it sounds to me like that is the upshot of this that the relations between the United States and Mexico, for that matter, Canada, uh, have been damaged in the process. That's what we have at the end of this long-term and acrimonious negotiation. Well, thank you, Carlos. Well, inter you, know, you know, I would just say, interestingly, with Mexico, it wasn't quite as acrimonious uh, in some ways. It represents actually a, a, a cooperation, because look at before this, the U.S.-Mexico relationship has been very nasty and ugly, so a very different outcome. But with Canada is where the real nastiness occurred. Thank you, Carlos Juarez, uh, the University of the Americas in Puebla, which is 60 yes. miles southeast of Mexico City. Get it right? Straight <laughs> east. Straight east. Straight east. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. making a map. Thank you so much, Carlos. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.